It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them. So they were in custody for a while. Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream. Both of them, each man's dream in one night, and each man's dream with its own interpretation. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked at them and saw that they were sad. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in the custody of his lord's house, Why do you look so sad today? We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph. Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you, and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and there were three white baskets on my head. In the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. This is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. Then he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. The butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Have you ever felt forgotten? The next chapter begins with these words. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And the butler said, oh yeah, I met this guy in jail that told me I would be restored based on a dream that I had. And then Joseph's life changed. Thirteen years after being 17 and sold into slavery by his own brothers, shipped off to Egypt, served in the captain of the guard's house, falsely accused by the guard's wife who wanted him because she couldn't have him. She didn't want anybody else to have him and falsely accused him. He was thrown in prison, and chapter 39 ends with the words that the captain of the guard there in the prison 
fully trusted Joseph. And it wasn't long till he was like the trustee, the guy running the place. And verse 1, it says, it came to pass after these things. That is like 11 years <laughs> from being 17. But at the age of 30, it all changed. So, and it revolves around this experience that occurred when he interpreted the dreams for the king's butler and baker. The butler would be like the cupbearer, the bartender, the one that oversaw the food and beverage, and no doubt had tasters test everything before the king would eat it. And so we don't know if the king got a stomach ache or something, but he got offended at the butler and the baker and threw them in prison while, I guess, an investigation was going on. And as a result of the investigation, the baker did not fare so well. The butler's head was lifted up, and as Joseph interpreted the baker's dream, his head was lifted off. There's a difference between up and off. <laughs> they told him one day when they were sad, he asked, what's the deal? They said, we've had a dream. There's no interpretation of it. And he said, do not interpretations belong to God. Has anybody ever had a dream? I mean, obviously, you have a dream of a better life. But you ever dream something at night, woke up and knew what the meaning was, or wondered if it had meaning? Or, or you wrote it down, or you didn't write it down, and you forgot it? You've ever had questions about that? Well, our text today brings us to this subject. So we're going to speak for the next few minutes on the way God speaks through dreams. The way he speaks through dreams. Um, at the conclusion of preparation for this message, I just Googled dream interpretation and I was appalled. What's out there in the name of Christianity? I, and, and some promoted by famous Christian TV personalities. These people have the answer. Teaching you how, like there's a technique, a course you can take to interpret dreams. Teaching that all dreams are from God. All of them? I've had some I know are not from God. <laughs> Teaching there's no such thing as a pizza dream. Well, obviously, pizza doesn't make you dream. But there are dreams that, that God is not speaking to you from. And uh, giving you a code book for breaking down and analyzing your dreams. These things are just to distract us, I think, from what God is saying. In my own personal experience, if God gives me a dream, it's either to comfort, to warn, or to direct. And if God gives me a dream, I know the meaning when I wake up. And in my case, I never forget it. Just with me. One example was uh, I was a new pastor of a new church, and it was disheartening when new people would come, you get excited, then they wouldn't stick. And so I struggled with do I give my heart to everybody or what do I do? And so I began to notice I was kind of holding people at arm's length till I was sure they were committed and all that. It was kind of a struggle. And the Lord helped me with a dream. One night I dreamed of a foundation being poured. The rebar was in place. There was even columns in place, rebar in place for columns. And there was a concrete pumper truck pumping concrete to build the foundation. Who's ever seen that done? We had a concrete pumper truck here when we poured this slab. Helps you reach out into, you know, large foundations. Problem was, concrete wasn't sticking. It was going everywhere because there was no forms. There was no scaffolding. Concrete was just bouncing off the rebar and not accumulating where it needed to accumulate. And I woke up, and I instantly knew the meaning. It related to my struggle. Are people going to be with us for life, or are they not going to be with us for life? And the Lord showed me from that dream that some people are with you for life. Some people are with you temporarily because they have assignments other places. They're like concrete forms. They're like scaffolding. 
you know, if you build a place and you don't remove the forms, it's kind of dumb, right? You're tripping over nails. It's not attractive. Um, you can't complete the structure because scaffolding is in the way. So there are some, not to diss people, but there are some people that may be with you for a season to fulfill a purpose, and then God moves them on to their next assignment. And that just healed my heart, and I was able to receive everybody with open arms. If they're just here for one Sunday, I'm thrilled. Hallelujah. Glad there was more than 12 folks here today. <laughs> so that was a dream that I needed. It was a word of direction, correction, comfort. It was God. The bottom line is God speaks, and he speaks through more than dreams. Like the colors of a rainbow, there's a spectrum of ways God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. And by his word, I mean the Bible, the inspired word of God, the scriptures that for centuries has proven to be faithful and inspired from the Lord. And all the other colors of the spectrum of God's voice are filtered through this. If it doesn't line up with his word, God's not going to contradict himself. Uh, hold off on it. Get some help with the interpretation. Judge that prophecy. He speaks to us through his voice. You may hear his voice, an audible voice. God generally doesn't speak any louder than he has to. If God is speaking to you in an audible voice, something is probably wrong. Like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It was a call to repentance. There's spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. There's the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation of tongues, the gift of prophecy. Prophecy is words of edification, that's to build you up. Exhortation, that's to call you up. And comfort, that's to calm you down. Words that build you up, call you up, and calm you down that are from God, these are words of prophecy. They're not necessarily predictions of the future. Then there's words of knowledge, a supernatural insight on what to do with your past so that God can give you words of wisdom what to do in the future. Words of knowledge, words of wisdom. Then the discerning of spirits. And is what I'm dealing with just me or people? Or is it the devil or demons? Or is God doing a major shift in my life? What's causing it? I heard a, a story of a couple of pastors that went to minister to a brother who was suicidal. I think I have demons. I'm wanting to kill myself. And so they went to spend some time with him, prayed for him. And the discerning of the spirits went into operation. And the brother says, this obviously isn't God, but I don't detect evil at work. Are you on any prescriptions? Yes, I take blood pressure medicine. Well, let's look at the bottle and see what the side effects are. And there were possible thoughts of suicide. So their word of wisdom was, try to get a different prescription. He did, the thoughts of suicide cleared up. Discerning of spirits. The inward witness. You just know stuff. Someone tells you something and it lines up with what God has spoken to you. There's the inward witness. Keep in mind all these things need to line up with God's word. Sound counsel. Someone that's gone before you can, can give you counsel. In the multitude of counsel there is safety. You can hear God speak through unbelievers through sound counsel. Somebody that has wisdom in an area that you need that can help you from making a mistake. God can speak through circumstances. We don't want to be led by circumstances, but circumstances can confirm whether or not you've heard God. Maybe you had a dream or someone prophesied over you or you heard an audible voice, you're going to be a country music star. <laughs> Spend a million dollars and your CD is going to make you a billion dollars. But the circumstances are you can't carry a tune in the bucket Chances are you need to deal with that circumstance first or that wasn't God speaking to you. And then God speaks through dreams and visions. Dreams are when you're asleep or the scriptures are a couple of times where a person was in a trance and the Lord gave him a vision during the trance. That's like a dream. A vision can be when you're wide awake and the Lord can give you insight into a situation, give you a picture, or literally make you think you saw something that, that wasn't there. Years ago, I was at a meeting at East Ridge Baptist Church 
And the speaker claimed that he had come to Granbury the day before, and the Lord spoke to him about great things he was going to do in our city. And I had just met him before the service. And he said, then I saw the sign, as I'm on the outskirts of the city, I saw a sign for Shady Grove Church. And <clears throat> he said, the Lord's going to do mighty things in this church. This church will be a liaison between the Metroplex and Granbury, and between Granbury and the Metroplex. And I'm sitting there thinking, what sign out on this part of town? At the time, we were meeting in the Seventh-day Adventist church, just around the corner from East Ridge Baptist Church. But I hid the word in my heart. And when we were looking for property, this was the best deal in town, $2,600 an acre. Owner finance, we got it. 17.638 acres, and it was paid off in 11 months, which is a whole other story. So during this time, I contacted this brother that had said he saw our sign. And I said, were you having a vision? He said, no, I thought I saw a sign. So God can speak to us through visions. God gives certain dreams to certain people at certain times. Abram was put to sleep while God cut covenant with God and predicted in this dream or vision, whatever you want to call it, that his descendants would go into slavery for 400 years. In Genesis chapter 20, we covered this. Abimelech, a king, was misled by Abraham to think his wife wasn't his wife, and he took her for his harem. And he had a dream, and the Lord in the dream told this king, you're a dead man unless you give that man's wife back to him. Jacob had a dream. When he's fleeing for his life from his brother, le left home with nothing but the clothes on his back and a stick, gets a rock, uses it for a pillow, sleeps his first night away from home, and has a vision of a ladder that stretches from earth to heaven. And God speaks to him from the top of that ladder. In Genesis 31, he had the dream of speckled livestock and began to do unusual things with pieces of wood and, and feeding and watering his, his animals. And uh, people are scratching their heads today. What in the world was that about? Well, God led him to do that in a dream. In, uh, the, at, towards the end of chapter 31, he's going to leave, and Laban, his father-in-law, wasn't going to let him. And he was warned, Laban was warned in a dream, you better leave Jacob alone let him go. In chapter 37, we learned of Joseph. He had his dreams, life-changing dreams. His family became jealous. His brother sold him into slavery to make sure it didn't come to pass. But it was like a stepping stone. God is so awesome that his biggest enemies are going to wind up working for him. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says, God made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of doom. At worst, they're his firewood. At best, they're a stepping stone to greatness. We just read about the butler and the baker and their dreams. These are dreams that are in the Bible, significant dreams. Next week or the next time I speak, the next chapter, we'll hear about Pharaoh's dreams and how Joseph interpreted those and was elevated through being a dream interpreter to becoming a prime minister. An amazing story. The book of Judges, Gideon is considering uh, attacking the enemies that, is just, that are just starving them out, and they send spies into the enemy's camp, the Midianites. And he hears them share uh, around the campfire about a scary dream. And one of them blurted out, Oh, I know the interpretation. Gideon's going to wipe us out. This gave Gideon courage to attack. So guidance came. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5, Solomon is asleep, and in a dream, God comes to him and says, Ask me anything, and I'll give it to you. And Solomon asked for wisdom. In the New Testament, Joseph was wondering what to do. His fiance is pregnant. He knows he's not the daddy. She's talking about, you know, carrying the Son of God in her womb and the angelic visitation. And he gets an angelic visitation in a dream. The wise men who came to see the baby Jesus were warned in a dream to not go back to Herod because Herod was up to no good. 
Joseph was warned to get out of Israel and go into Egypt till that situation changed so it was safe to come back. In another dream, he was told to return. And on their journey, he had another dream that adjusted their journey. Don't go back to Judea. Go to Galilee because there's another wicked ruler in position. In chapter 27, just prior to the the crucifixion of Christ, Pilate is warned by his wife. She says, I've had a dream and you don't need to have anything to do with this situation with Jesus. So what does he do? He washes his hands, takes the chicken way out. Numbers chapter 12, God says, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. And he goes on to say, but Moses, I speak to him face to face. In Daniel, which is another amazing dream interpreter guy, it says in chapter 2, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions in your head upon your bed were these. And the book takes off. So unusual was Daniel's ministry of dream interpretation. He could tell the king what his dream was. In Joel 2.28, and it's echoed in Acts 2.17, God prophesies, it shall come to pass in the last days or afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh who want to receive more of God's spirit. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That's to speak inspired utterances. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Can you say supernatural visitation? visitation. The Bible's full of all sorts of stories, some of which involve dreams. Some of the dreamers weren't even believers. So you may be here today, have doubts about the gospel, have doubts as to whether or not Jesus is the Son of God, and God maybe has given you a dream, and you're perplexed with the interpretation of it. It could be he's speaking to you. It's my understanding in the Middle East, there's a lot of Muslims becoming Jesus followers because of him appearing to them in their dreams. You say dreams. 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 God-given dreams are usually easily remembered. Now, I said that because in my case, they've always been remembered, but you don't want to take your experience and make a rule out of it, right? Some people use this as a verse for forgetting dreams. The king said, Daniel 2, 3, I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. If you dig into the verse, he's anxious to understand the dream. But he doesn't trust his resident magicians to tell them the dream because they'll just make something up. He needs to know it's the real deal. He knows it's significant. So they're going to have to know what it is before he tells them. So in interpreting your dream, if it is a significant one, be careful you don't go to somebody that's just going to make something up. In your dreaming, it doesn't mean every single detail of the dream has meaning, right? In my case, the the brand of the concrete uh, pumper truck wasn't significant. Whether or not the concrete would pass the slump test was significant. Whether or not the rebar was rusted wasn't significant. All those things were frames for the picture of stop rejecting people. Understand the value of temporary assignments. So, here we go. God will help interpret the dreams that he gives. If he gives you a dream, he's not going to leave you in mystery the rest of your life. He's trying to communicate something to you. And if he's not going to give you the dream interpretation but someone else, that is his effort to lead you somewhere. So be careful who you go to. Genesis 40, we read this. We each had a dream and there's no interpreter for it, of it. And Joseph says, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. You know, all the while he wondered about his dream interpretation. Because his life didn't reflect 
His dream was his family bowing down to him. He didn't know it was a picture of the future when he would be elevated to a position of prime ministership that one day his brothers would come in and bow down to him needing food. In Psalm 105, talking about the story of Abraham's family, it says that God sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. It's like, God, why couldn't you just leave me alone? Why did you give me that dream? And so that word just spurred him onward and purified his life and kept him on his straight and narrow because he knew there was something significant God was wanting to do. In the next chapter, we're going to see this. Pharaoh says to Joseph, I had a dream. There's no one who can interpret it. I heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph responds, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So it's God who gives the interpretation of dreams. Not someone's technique book or someone's formula or someone's creative personality. If it's from God, God has the interpretation for you. God can grant the ability to interpret a dream. Maybe it's a call to pray. In fact, I believe all dreams are calls to pray. Lord, what is the meaning of this? Why do I keep, if it's a repetitive dream, why do I, why do I keep dreaming that I'm at school in my underwear? <laughs> the insecurity probably, who knows? He can grant the ability to interpret a dream. In talking about Daniel in chapter 1 of the book named after him, as for these four young men, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Belteshazzar, that was Daniel's Babylonian name, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God gave him this ability, not just for a dream, but for plural dreams. Dreams and visions should lead to our obeying him. Sometimes they don't. God warns a person in a dream, and they just plow right on forward with their disobedient life. They can't say God didn't warn them, but they should lead to our obeying him. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius has this vision, and in the vision, he's told to send for Peter. He was a devout man that he didn't know the Lord and Peter was going to be used in his life. Simultaneously, Peter has a vision of this blanket filled with unclean animals coming down from heaven and a voice saying, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter responded, no, Lord. And the Lord said, do not call unclean what I have cleansed. This happened three times. Was the Lord telling him to give up a kosher lifestyle? Just chow down on some pork chops and shrimp? I don't think so. I don't think so. It was a dream to shock him into realizing his own prejudice against people that weren't kosher and to stop calling them unclean. And so when some people who were viewed as unclean by people of his ethnicity approached him to come to their house, he jumped at the chance. Having had that vision, he was obedient. In chapter 16, Paul is called to take the gospel to Macedonia, to leave Asia and to go into Europe with the gospel. Are you glad the gospel made it to Europe? The obedience to a vision. In Corinth, there were some heavy hitters there, and Paul was encouraged in a vision to be bold. Don't back down. In his testimony, chapters later, to a king, he shares his testimony, and he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Have you been obedient to the visions and dreams God has given you? Have you? If God gives you a promise, there's conditions to that promise. Well, the Lord told me I was going to be a missionary to Timbuktu. Well, have you started studying French? No. Do you have a passport? Have you had your shots? I was a missionary's kid in 1965. And I remember our passports had yellow cards in them that had proof of all our shots. Yellow fever, typhoid, 
Malaria, no, there was no malaria shots, we wish. Anyway, back to the sermon. Not all dreams are going to be God-given. I'm not sure. I bought one of those books you're talking about. I think it's pretty good. I think all my dreams are from God. Really? Well, then explain these verses. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams Deuteronomy 13, arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder. They dream something and it comes to pass. And the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods which you have known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Don't pay any attention to them. Well, they came to pass. It must be of God. No, I don't think so because it's leading people astray. Jeremiah 23, I've heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed. I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Don't be distracted by the dreams of false prophets, even if their dreams do come to pass. If they distract you from devotion to the Lord Jesus, it's not good. Zechariah 10, verse 2 says, For the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie, and have told false dreams. They comfort in vain. Oh, I had a dream, and you're going to be a millionaire. You don't even have to go get a job. You can quit school. God's just going to do it. Well, God can do it, but that kind of violates his principles. Faith without works is dead. Um, prosperity is spelled S-W-E-A-T. <laughs> God can do it. All things are possible to him who believes but it doesn't mean everything is probable based on the conditions. So if the Lord has given you a promise, what are the conditions of those promises? Are you being faithful? Joseph was faithful to God's promises. So when the opportunity to become his boss's wife's boy toy, he did not yield to the temptation. He said, how can I do this wickedness to your husband and to God? He held true to the conditions for God's promises in his life. And finally, therefore, because not all dreams are God-given, all dreams should lead us to pray. If they're from God, we need to pray. If they're not from God, we need to pray. <laughs> they're calls to pray. If they're disturbing, you don't know what they mean, and they're just confusing, pray! <laughs> if they're from the enemy, he may back off. Oh, you know, every time we do that, they pray. All dreams should lead us to his word. What's the biblical principle involved here? What is his word? All the ways he speaks, it all boils down to his word. What is God saying? Back to the call to pray. A long time ago, I had a dream that I was in a service, kind of up like this, and my job in the service was to pray. But in the back were some, please don't take this personal, I'm not picking on you, but there was some homosexual activists stirring up a ruckus. And I thought, well, I'm here to pray, but before I pray, I'm going to deal with this commotion back here. So I went back to deal with the commotion, and all hell broke loose, and I woke up. And here came the interpretation. You should have prayed. <laughs> and I never forgot it. So anytime I hear of commotion in the church or someone's not happy or maybe there's some discord, the first thing I do is pray. And sometimes before the day's over, the person comes walking in the building. It's a beautiful thing when he does that. You don't have to call, hey, can we talk? No, you, you just come in and it just becomes natural. Natural deal. 
I was with my dad one time, and uh, his phone went off. He was pastoring a church in Atlanta area. His phone went off, and he could hear a guy just yelling at another member of the church. He was calling her name, just really letting her have it. And he hung up. Dad said, what was that about? I said, Dad, that's a beautiful thing. You're a witness. You did not have to confront a situation based on hearsay or witnesses. Just based on what you heard, you call that brother and say, brother, what's going on? Let's get this straight. So if there's opportunities in your life where you learn of disorder under your authority in some way, and... <clears throat> You're, you have firsthand knowledge, don't waste that. Go for it. Don't, don't, just go for it. I don't know why I'm saying that. It didn't have anything to do with the sermon, but it has to do with what God enables you to do. It should lead us to his word. He gives us steps of actions from these things. Circumstances, sound counsel, inward witness, dreams and visions, spiritual gifts, the voice of God. It all boils down to his word. I have a new favorite verse. This is for you, Debbie Tran. It says, let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain? Compared to God's word, a dream is just straw. You read that again. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. So it's what God is saying that's important. Stop holding people at arm's length. Embrace everybody. Walk in unconditional love. Stop being afraid. For what has the straw to do with grain, declares the Lord, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. Debbie Tran is swinging a hammer. <laughs> She's got a word from God that if you'll listen and take it to heart, it will warm your heart for the Lord. You may be facing something really big and God has given you a dream and the answer you need may be in that dream. Maybe. I called my children yesterday just to pick their brains about their dreams. And they both remember this happening when they were in elementary age school. We came home from church in Irving one Sunday night, and our dog had a red ring around his white neck. It was American Eskimo dog, Nikki. And we pulled the thick fur back, and there was a hole here. And on the other side of the neck was a hole there. Someone had shot him in the neck. And so we determined to take the dog to the vet the next morning. So they're just traumatized. And we prayed. They went to sleep. The next morning, Summer gets up, comes into the breakfast area and says, I just saw Jesus. He just came in my room, lit up the room, and told me not to fear, said, I've healed your dog. We took the dog to the vet, took the precautions, and the dog fully recovered. Years later, we gave him away, and they fed a turkey skeleton to him and killed him. <laughs> That's beside the point. I shared, I'm just keeping it real. Keeping it real. Keeping it real. The Bible tells a whole story, doesn't it? In our culture, we're used to whitewashing our history. That's the problem we got in our culture, too. I shared this story with relatives, and my grandma said, you don't think God cares about your old dog? I said, probably not as much as we do, but he cares about my daughter's faith. Years later, my daughter had this amazing dream, and it came to pass the same day she had it. She had just become a labor and delivery nurse. She was still getting orientated. And she dreamed that there was an emergency delivery at work where a mother went into labor, her water broke, and the umbilical cord came out first. A good portion of it did. When that happens, it's, it's an emergency because the baby's weight can mash the 
umbilical cord flat and there could be a suffocation, so it's called for an emergency C-section. Matter of minutes, you gotta do it. So she shared the dream with her boss the next day when she got to work. She said, what did you do in the dream? She says, I put on a sterile glove and I reached in the mother's womb and held the baby up off of the umbilical cord while the C-section took place. She said, that's exactly what you need to do. Hours later, someone in labor's water broke and it happened, the umbilical cord came out. So her boss said, well, you dream doing this, so do it. She says, I had to get up on the gurney or on the bed while the girl's being wheeled from the delivery room into surgery and I'm holding the baby up off of the umbilical cord. And she says, I'm holding the mother's hand with one hand, speaking words of comfort to her. She says, now I'm under the sheet. You can't even see me. And I feel the baby's hand grab my finger. She said, I had full confidence because I had already done it in my dream. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, you would guard us and keep us from going astray by dreams. But help us, Lord, to be strengthened and encouraged from the dreams that you give. Protect us from false interpretations, but, Lord, make us mindful of true interpretations. And, Lord, may we remember there are conditions to your promises, and, Lord, may we be faithful to them in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask you to confirm your word today with signs and wonders to show your love to your people. In Jesus' name, amen.